much for being here today. I'm sorry that we don't have quite enough room, but I'm really glad we have this fantastic turnout where we don't have enough room. <laughs> Thank you for making our this year's Arts, Art Highlights and Tea series start off with a great big bang. Before I forget, I want to acknowledge and thank the lovely volunteer team who put the tea together today, uh, headed up by Ann Broom. Uh, that's, the tea is part of the thing for those who sign up in advance and aren't on the waiting list. This we do this Art Highlights and Tea once a month, January, February, March, and April. I am talking next February 10 on our Remington acquisitions, including this one. If you would like to know more about our activities, programs, events, and other fun stuff, you can fill one of these things out. They're right by the door and become a member of the Frederick Remington Art Museum. I see many members among you, including Robert Sharon. <laughs> So, uh, thank you so much for uh, doing a great deal of work to put this together, Robert. Robert is teacher of architecture and design at Onondaga Community College, and he's from Ogdensburg, New York. Yeah. in the 19th century, um, it, it was all about eclecticism. Uh, government buildings were built in maybe a Greek or Roman revival style. Hospitals, because the Egyptians invented medicine, might be an Egyptian <laughs> revival style. Churches in a Gothic revival style, and so on. So that kind of sets the stage, I think, for the development of Augsburg. And here we go, here we go. So this is a poster here that we did. Uh, for this, and if you are uh, an architect seeking uh, continuing ed credit on the back after there's a sign-up sheet, uh, you can put your information, and if you want a certificate, uh, we can have the Central New York chapter send it to you. And so, um, Renaissance uh, artists and architects looked at outdoor spaces and streets as uh, public spaces as outdoor rooms, with the ceiling being the sky and the walls being the facades. Uh, buildings that kind of define the space, and the floor with the ground cover or pavement underneath. And so that's kind of uh, how I envision Ogdensburg moving forward. So this little perspective box here is uh, a place where we can put our ideas and look for the future development of Ogdensburg. And so um, what is architecture? Good question. And uh, this mouse here is... Goethe said uh, it was frozen music. Uh, Winston Churchill said we shape architecture as much as it shapes us. And of course, uh, Vitruvius, 
this is a little tricky, this mouse here, um, wrote a book, uh, and he defined architecture as firmness, commodity, and light, delight. Firmness being the structural integrity, commodity being it answers the program of spaces and facilities that are required whenever you build anything. And delight, you know, just to delight the senses, basically, just as art or music does. Come on, little mouse, there we go. I'd like to dedicate this to my mentor, uh, Paul Malo, who uh, taught, in the, he was my advisor when I was an undergraduate in the School of Architecture, and through my graduate studies, I worked with him uh, on a number of projects all the way uh, up until he passed away. And incidentally, there's a connection between Paul and the Remington, and he was an advisor for the New York State Council of the Arts when they built the first edition in the 1960s, uh, here just behind us. And I have to admit, some of this is autobiographical. <laughs> uh, I moved to Ogden, we moved to Ogdensburg in 1953. I was seven years old. Uh, and so I witnessed a lot of what's transpired uh, in recent decades. And one of the things my dad used to do is take us out and about, uh, go for a Sunday drive. And I remember uh, that summer of 1953 taking a boat tour around Alexandria Bay. We saw this building before it was demolished, and uh, Castle Rest. And I said to myself, I said, who are these people? You know, what do they do? What are they doing here? I've never seen anything like this, being from northern Maine. It made quite an impression on me. So uh, several years later, Paul called me up and said that he had a grant. And would I like to assist uh, him with a photographic survey of the Thousand Islands? And it's been ongoing ever since. <coughs> And it's entitled Castles and Cottages. Now, you may have heard that before. Somebody borrowed the title for a book, but that's fine. You know, kind of flat up here. And we have some 14, 15,000 images, drawings, photographs of castles, cottages, interiors, exteriors, boat houses, um, yacht houses, and so on. But that's a subject for another time. But it, it, it started, my love affair with the river started with that first boat tour in 1953. It continues to this day. So I picked out a few slides. Uh, Julie Madlin, is Julie here? The city of story has been sending me stuff. And I think most of you have seen these, so I'll be brief. Uh, but it was a vibrant river community. It was a center of transportation, industry, uh, religion. Uh, and if you were in the Thousand Islands, many people um, came up for extended periods of time to spend at their cottage or at one of the large hotels there. And they might even stay for the entire season. And of course, there would come a time when you would want to go and maybe do some shopping, visit some different restaurants that were available in the area. And so when you think of steamships, most people think, oh, Mississippi River. When in fact, the St. Lawrence River had, at least during the summer, a lot more traffic than any other place in North America at the time. So you might take this uh, steamship. Uh, New York, down to Ogdensburg. And uh, so this is a cottage, uh, it's still there on Cherry Island, uh, Ballora, Angleside. It's had a couple of different names. And Williams and Johnston, does that make a connection with anybody here? Yeah, yeah. Ogdensburg Architects designed a number of significant buildings throughout the Thousand Islands. We'll see a little bit more about them later. <coughs> so they would come to old Ogdensburg for shopping. And Ford Street was kind of described as the Fifth Avenue of Northern New York. Now, that's probably a bit of a stretch, but still, it was important. And you have to think back in those days, you know, there were no roads. Yes, there was a railroad connection to Watertown, but it was, uh, it was more difficult than just simply hopping on a steamship. And the city has just a tremendous architectural heritage. Uh, Alfred Millet was... Uh, a well-known <coughs> architect working for the federal government, designed many famous buildings in Washington, D.C., and elsewhere throughout the country. <coughs> the city it was a cultural center, had its own opera house, and the site of the oldest federal government building that's in continuous, has been in operation uh, since uh, the very beginning. It was originally the uh, parish store transportation center. Three railroads service this little community. Rome, Watertown, and Ogdensburg, the, uh, what became the Rutland Railroad, and there was something called the Unicon Potsdam, which combined later with the Rome 
water tower and all this other stuff. It was important. Uh, airplane factory later became uh, Delta Airlines. Delta. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And um, landscaping was very important. There were beautiful tree lined residential streets uh, framed with elm trees. And they, they create this kind of cathedral like. Uh, uh, space that kind of frames the street. And the first blight to hit Augensburg was not urban renewal, it was Dutch Elms disease. And I think Andrea has something to say about that. Um, but tourism continued, uh, continues to this day. <clears throat> so I'm not going to talk about Dutch Elms disease, <laughs> but I am going to talk for just a moment about. Um, first, I'll take a moment to tell you what my role in today's presentation is going to be, which is that as Robert talks about the history of, of Ogdensburg, some of the his, um, architectural um, relevance in Ogdensburg, I'll just be sprinkling in some bits and pieces of things that the city, specifically the planning department, is doing now. So um, following the comment on Dutch Elm disease, I'm going to give you a little update on what the city is doing um, for maintaining and preserving our urban tree resources. Um, the city has taken great value in our tree resources. We have been a Tree City USA for 14 years in a row, sorry, 18 years in a row. Um, and we have been very successful in receiving tree planting grants from the federal and state governments. Most recently, we completed 120 trees that are planted all along the Osagachi and St. Lawrence River uh, with funding provided through the EPA and the U.S. Forest Service. And this is a sign that you'll be seeing um, in the spring that will be placed uh, down by the small boat launch in um, on the Maple City Trail on the Oscar River, which, not that I can reach that high, but it's in that kind of nook of the river there. So you'll be seeing a sign that shows a little bit about the tree planting that we recently completed. This follows um, a tree inventory and management plan that the city received funding from New York State DEC to do a complete inventory of the city's trees that also uh, shows us their tree health and helps us manage them into the future. So we really have been taking steps towards protecting and preserving our trees in the city so that we are not devastated by things like Dutch Elm disease or emerald ash borer in the future. And th these are just some pictures of that tree planting program that I just mentioned. Okay, um, I think what's been a spark for the renewal in our historic architecture. Unfortunately, significant buildings were lost over time. And so this is a little segment on that. Uh, the Peacock Yacht House had this cathedral-like interior. Uh, it was a photo I took in 1979. And these heavy timbers were steam bent and laid out on the ice, uh, assembled together, and then lifted into place to uh, form the frame for the building. And it burned, uh, And another more recent loss was the guzzle at Thousand Island Park, which is a historic community. It's on the National Register. Uh, and the building was a total loss. Unfortunately, at the far end of this photo were a couple of bays. That's where the fire trucks were. And when the fire started, it knocked out the electrical service to the building. They couldn't get the doors open. They went around to the back. By the time they got them open, the heat was just too intense. Um, I think maybe the most significant loss is Pennsylvania Station by McKim, Mead, and White. They were probably this country's uh, most noteworthy architects uh, at the end of the 19th century. And it's modeled after a Roman thermae or a Roman bath. And you can see here it took up a large tract of land. It was in existence for a little over 50 years, and it was demolished here. So this is the the entry hall, the grand concourse, with not, this is, uh, these are all kind of iron and glass uh, ceilings here that you see. And uh, Norman Mailer used to say, you came into New York City feeling like a king when you went through the Grand Central Terminal, but now you come in feeling like a rat. It's still there, <laughs> it's all underground. This is what replaced it, Madison Square Garden. The sculpture, the, uh, all the architectural elements that were on the facade of the column were uh, removed 
and hauled off to a landfill in Secaucus, New Jersey, which was later paved over. It's now a parking lot mm -hmm. for a trucking company. Mm -hmm. uh, incidentally, uh, the governor just announced that they're going to, um, they, they want to renovate or restore and uh, kind of bring back some of old Penn Station. And the building right behind it was the old U.S. Post Office, which is also a McKinley White building. And uh, that plan has been in the works for a number of years. Um, Hel Horatio Nelson White, you'll remember this name here in a few more minutes when we'll talk about the Community Design Center. He was a <coughs> well-known uh, Syracuse architect. Uh, if you're familiar with the courthouse in Watertown, I don't they look very familiar. <coughs> Next time you're there, take a look. And also designed by Horatio Nelson White. And all the buildings to the left of the monument are now gone. The building to the far right here in the corner is also gone. The rest of the buildings are extant and form the heart of the kind of urban core of downtown Syracuse. Uh, Paul Malo, who I mentioned earlier, in an effort to try to save the courthouse, uh, the idea of adaptive reuse was kind of new back in the 60s. And so he proposed kind of a community center, a performance space, concert hall. Uh, all this stuff kind of fell on deaf ears. And the building is demolished. Uh, in Ogdensburg, we moved here. Uh, my dad was transferred from Northern Maine, and he became the manager of the J.J. Newberry store. And just before the Christmas season was about to get underway, there was a fire that totally demolished the building. I've seen photographs. I haven't been able to locate one of the fire in progress, but this is a Betty Steele. Is Betty here, by the way? She is somebody who is phenomenal. She has also recorded uh, as a photographer. Uh, many of the scenes that are uh, uh, part of what, uh, what we're talking about this year, uh, 90 some odd years old. Um, after the fire, two years later, J.J. Newberry, uh, which was a chain of five, and started out as five and dime stores, and then kind of evolved into kind of department store slash five and dime stores. And they rebuilt this. And I think this is a testament to their faith in the future of the city. Uh, at the time, this was the largest Newberry store that they had among their almost 600 stores coast to coast. This was in the local paper here. Uh, uh, Saul Kaplan had a, uh, just down the street here, uh, had a uh, men's clothing store. He wasn't that short. My dad wasn't that tall. <laughs> so this was in the, uh, in the published in the journal. So this is uh, a Betty Steele photo taken uh, from the foot of Ford Street. And here you see that. The Hotel McConville was also demolished before River Renewal. He got into a uh, property tax dispute and it, it didn't go well, so he said, oh, well, I'll just take the building up. But he went on to uh, have a, a construction business, he used to write uh, art, uh, a column for the journal, for the advanced news. So now here's the beginning of the end, really. Yeah. And, uh, as a student, and I, I used to go around and talk to all these merchants, and my dad was a merchant. I said, you know, this, all these buildings are worth saving. I mean, this is, once it's gone, it's gone forever. I couldn't find a single person, this is true, I couldn't find a single person who agreed with me except Pucker O'Grady, who just passed away recently. He was the bartender at the local teenage drinking establishment. You'd go buy a, a draft beer for 15 cents, you'd give him a quarter, he'd give you two nickels back. One was your change. The other one went into this big pickle jar at the end of the bar. That was his campaign fund. He managed. He ran as an independent many times, and he was opposed to urban renewal. I just got a call from a guy named Scott Atkinson, who's uh, uh, the news director of Channel 7 in Watertown. And he said that his dad, Harry, was the director of urban renewal from 1966 to 69. And he was also adamantly opposed to the idea of demolishing downtown. And um, he, he quit in 1969 as frust in frustration and moved back to Watertown. Uh, he did suggest, however, that, you know, in Ottawa, there's something called the Spark Street Mall, which is where they closed off the thoroughfare and for a few blocks and created this pedestrian mall. The difference is they kept the buildings. It's pretty successful these days. Our family home was threatened with demoli demolition. It's right up here um, on the corner of Green and Caroline Street. 
it was going to make a nice parking lot. Mm -hmm. I, I literally, I was so scared, I was so freaked out a long time. And uh, this was actually a paper I wrote as a student. And what you see on the left, that was um, the, the building shaded in gray are commercial buildings, but all the other lots that you see there had residences on them. They were all part of the tax base for the city. And this is what was proposed. And let's see if I can see. Our, our house is right here. And um, I think it would be interesting to do a figure ground drawing where you darken in all the buildings that were part of the tax rolls back in the uh, late 50s and early 60s as a justification of how we could maybe restore some of that. And I'll get to that in a little bit here. Um, is Bonnie Pearson here? Yeah. Okay. How do you do? Thank you for sending me this map. Uh, most of you are familiar with this. This is something she did, and it lists all the property owners uh, on the map here. Uh, the part that's not there is where City Hall is, and uh, for Remington, the library, and so on. And now a lot of the buildings were gone, and I was walking around, and this guy, ah, the light is not so good. He's giving, he's giving me quite a scowl because I'm photographing. Oh. I, I don't know. I mean, is, is this a trench where they're pouring concrete for the footings for the new buildings, or is this, I don't know what it is, a utility trench? You know, but obviously there's no formwork or anything that you would normally find in concrete. There, there couldn't be much excavation. The ground was frozen. Uh, I think bedrock is uh, many, many feet below grade. But this is where part of uh, where the mall is now. Okay. And I drove into town once with a friend. I don't know, was it you, Randy? That it could have been, you know. And, yeah. and uh, whoever it was, it was said, so why did they decide to build a prison? <laughs> I said, no, that's urban renewal. And now this is. It, you know, everybody I think knows this elevation. This is the side that faces the St. Lawrence River. I think the greatest asset this community has, and any community on the waterfront has. And uh, Andrea and I were walking around the Blivens building, and there's some nice offices and stuff. There's one little tiny window next to some vending machines, and that's your view, the spectacular view. So I think opening this up to the river uh, would be something to think about. This is the facade that faces the other river, the Oswegosh. Um, Gertrude Stein, uh, author, born in the U.S., but lived most of her life in, in, in Europe, uh, came back in the 1930s for a lecture tour. And when she was in San Francisco, she decided to go over to Oakland to try and find her childhood home. And she couldn't. Hence the famous quote, there is no there there. So, back to Thomas Cole. Now, around the turn of the last century, architects were beginning to say, you know, the way to the future is not through the past. And uh, this was kind of at the birth of the modern movement here. Okay, so what were they thinking? And I think this ties in a lot with the thinking that went on uh, with the demolition of, of uh, Ogdensburg. I usually don't like to throw a lot of text, but take a moment to read this here. And uh, children are immoral. And by, and so by our standards of Papuans, Papuans? Papuans, thank you, there we go. I'll get it right eventually. And uh, it goes down to say that the, the Papuans tatter them, uh, tattoo themselves, decorate their boats, their oars, everything they can get their hands on. But a modern man who tattoos himself is either a criminal or a degenerate. <laughs> Why are there prisons where 80% of the convicts are tattooed? And tattooed men who are not in prison are either latent criminals or degenerate aristocrats. <laughs> when, I, when I show this to my students, there's a riot in the, in the classroom. <laughs> you know, uh, and so uh, when a tattooed man dies at liberty, it simply means he hasn't had time to commit his crime. <laughs> so uh, modernists didn't have clients. They had very radical ideas. Uh, and so what they would do is they would come up with these design projects in manifestos. So this was a manifesto by a guy named uh, uh, Adolf Loos here, and uh, have therefore evolved the following maxim that pronounced it to the world, the evolution of culture marches with the elimination of ornament from useful objects. Elimination means abolish. And here's some examples here. 
Okay. Uh, the futurist movement, in mostly centered mostly in Italy, uh, one of the architects, Antonio Santalia, was developing all these projects for transportation centers, railroad stations, and power stations, and maybe maybe office buildings. But this was the, the key to the future, as you saw. And there was a, a writer who's part of this movement named Manetti, and he wrote to replace like uh, old cities like Milan, we should blow them sky high, <laughs> level them, and then replace them with projects like this. As a student, we were very interested in Le Corbusier, uh, a, a, a very talented, very famous, perhaps maybe the most famous 20th century uh, modernist architect. Uh, but then uh, he didn't have many clients either. And you have to think of the time period because um, you've got the early modern movement sandwiched. You've got two world wars, and sandwiched in between is the Great Depression. So about all they could do is write manifestos, write books, as you see here. And Corbu was saying, well, you know, uh, if you're going to design a building, you're not thinking of the past, but you, uh, you're thinking of like the, the aesthetics might, that might shape the future, you know, the machine, the, the airplane, the, the steamship, and so on. And that we could build on a much, much larger scale with modern materials. And without clients, they were, you know, building nice little cardboard models that looked great <laughs> in black and white photography. And they published those kind of images. And then he got into doing this book here, uh, 1933, called Radiant City. And this was a project uh, that he uh, needs the plan for a neighborhood in Paris. And this is what he planned to replace Paris with here. And I, I think it's kind of fanciful. You can see the airplane and the shadow on the ground, the airplane coming in for a landing in the midst of these high-rise buildings here. And this is a figure ground. I mentioned figure ground plans earlier. So if you're familiar with Paris, Notre Dame is here, the Louvre is here, and he was going to re demolish all this stuff. He proposed doing this. Thank God they did. <laughs> but this was a model that he did here. And Ile de Cité, where Notre Dame is, is right there. The lower left-hand corner is the Louvre. And uh, because of the times, the depressions, the world wars, these ideas were promoted but never tested. So after World War II, there was a big rush to build more housing. And a lot of it proved to be uh, just unsuccessful. So here's one. There's Caprini, Caprini Green in, in Chicago. Uh, you know, these things didn't last very long and ended up being demolished. Okay. So a uh, number of organizations uh, were realizing that, you know, our past is slipping away. So there was there were several programs to kind of uh, at least record it with photographs, and that has the American Building Survey with architectural drawings. So this was a project during the Depression to help not only record the past, but to help keep architects employed. I like this one. Here's an outhouse. <laughs> Nothing escaped their sharp eye. Um, historic surveys. This is uh, nominating buildings to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Sackets Harbor, Madison Barracks, where we dug up a lot of old drawings, photographed buildings, and so on. Uh, and the National Trust uh, for Historic Preservation has a magazine called Preservation. And in the, in the late 70s, they, they also realized, too, that you know, our past is slipping away. And there's nothing more iconic about what America is, is Main Street. And so they started to publish a series of articles in the late 70s. And by the early 80s, they actually started a foundation program. And now there are statewide Main Street programs all across the country. Or you could go to Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So I'm going to talk for a minute about the city's uh, Main Street programs. We have been successful in getting two Main Street programs. We, they were awarded in 2009 and 2010, and they were wrapped up in 2014. And this is, this is funding from New York State that is primarily used as a facade improvement program, although it funds can also be used to make improvements to the interior of buildings to address code compliance and handicap accessibility. And with these funds, these are all of the projects that were assisted with funding through those two grants. But probably the two that you might notice most on our main street, which is 4th Street, are uh, the Dillingham Insurance Building and Philip Steiner. 
So these are two examples of projects that were recently completed with assistance through the New York State Main Street program that have... Uh, deconstructors, if you will, uh, to tear things down. Ogdensburg doesn't have the workforce, the labor force, the equipment to do that kind of stuff. It really is not going to be a jobs project that's going to benefit the local community in any way. And so with Homer and with Ogdensburg, I said, you know, let's use the talents, the resources, and the people we have here, you know, the contractors, the various tradespeople, to uh, restore the facades. And this was an article for the Cortland County Historical Association uh, magazine. And this was in 1967. Randy, I think you worked on that too. Remember Durkee's Bakery? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, you know, last fall, I, was, I wonder whatever happened to Homer, you know? So it's still I, there. It's still there. It sure is. There it is. Wow. There it is. There it is. There it is. And I was just uh, delighted to see, to see this. Uh, with a lot of urban unrest uh, in the 1960s in uh, American urban centers, there was something called community design centers that would be done. And uh, Trudy, who unfortunately couldn't make it here, has been involved with, and I think you guys have been involved with the community design center in Rochester. It doesn't exist in Syracuse anymore, uh, but I worked for them for about six years. And uh, we did a number of different projects, um, working with uh, low-income families who could buy a house that was abandoned, not on the tax rolls anymore, and they were given a $6,800 grant, I think, and they would match that with their sweat equity. And we would help deal with like code compliance issues and you know as much as the budget would allow for any kind of restoration here. Uh, one of the things that happens is that absentee landlords who own a lot of these as rental properties you know, all the furnace is going, all the roof is going, well, I'll put it off, I'll put it off. And after a while, they just kind of walk away and stop paying taxes. And it would take eight or nine years, in Syracuse at least, for the city to kind of take title to that building after all this time. By then, it was too late. It was too far gone. And so Plan Build helped craft some legislation. We worked with the Common Council and the, uh, the City Development Agency to help uh, shorten that to about three years, or three years and six months or so. So a lot could be done with this building. Uh, and I saw your name, Randy, in uh, uh, Hardin's book, uh, mm -hmm. and that you were involved in this. And it's, I think it started with a uh, plan bill project. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, the Horatio Nelson White. Remember the courthouse that I showed you? That was built uh, as a wedding present for his daughter in something called the Holly Green Neighborhood. And this was a rundown inner city neighborhood back in the 70s. This building had holes in the roof. There had been a fire. Um, this is what it looks like today. And it, take, it takes a while to do this stuff. But this is just a vibrant, uh, you know, active uh, neighborhood. This is, says a lot. We also worked with uh, uh, various uh, government agencies. We were not architects in a way. We were not trying to compete with architects. They were helping fund us, one of the New York State Council of the Arts. But we, we developed uh, drawings and we developed proposals that uh, people could then use, community groups could use, to try and secure funding for a project. This building, unfortunately, was the old Central Tech High School. It still uh, is sitting there vacant, largely. Um, but a success story, Sonnenberg Gardens, uh, near Canandaigua, wanted to have a small cafeteria. And the carriage house was right there. So we designed a cafe that would be in there for visitors to use. The cafe did get funded, did get built. It's not exactly what you see here. But at least the ideas that we put forth help uh, kind of kind of turn this project around. And I'll talk a little bit about historic preservation in Thousand Island Park. Most of you know, are probably familiar with it. So I'll speed through some of this stuff. But it's on the National Register. It's about 300 acres. It has about 330 uh, contributing structures. There, Trudy Feidelson, who couldn't make it today, was instrumental in getting this listed on the National Register. And uh, it was a Methodist campground community. People started uh, living in tents on tent platforms. Mm -hmm. And gradually, wood, wood frame cottages were built. This is where the guzzle, the ice cream store, fire occurred. <coughs> and uh, in most communities, when you uh, 
go to the planning board and you want to get a, a, per a permit to build a building, you know, you pay a fee. And what happens is that the building inspector comes out and says, okay, yeah, the, the, the electrical's good, okay. And then, okay, the plumbing is good, okay, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. Now you get a certificate of occupancy. This was very different. Uh, I used that plan build model to work with the residents in it, uh, at Thousand Island Park, and there was a lot of kind of resistance to preservation. You know, well, they can't tell me what to do. We're a land-based kind of uh, country, and uh, but it's a privately held corporation. And so, what I would they would get up to four hours of my time, and I can draw almost as fast as I can talk. I think, and, uh, but I couldn't design a whole project. But I could help kind of work with the owners and steer it in a direction that I think would work with the planning board and the preservation board. And uh, I think it was, this, I think, Bill, <coughs> this was a, one of your projects, right? That looks familiar. <laughs> it looks familiar. <laughs> it's on, on a prospect point, I think. Okay. And, and so it was like we were a team working toward, toward a goal, you know. And uh, some other little quickie drawings here. Uh, we had a, uh, we still have a preservation code. It's about, I don't know, like 80, 90 pages uh -huh. long. Yeah. And, but we wanted to have a visual guide, you know, rather than reading mm -hmm. paragraphs and paragraphs of boring stuff. So uh, we were commissioned to put together a, uh, a like a pattern book, if you will. And uh, so actually, the one in the top center, this was actually um, a proposed addition to a to an existing cottage, like the one you see on the far left. And, and look how high the roof is, you know. And, and it was done not by an architect, it was done by an engineer. And I think it's important to say that historic preservation, it's a specialized field. And most architects, you know, who might be designing larger projects are not really that familiar with working in, in this kind of thing. So, uh, but there are exceptions and I'm glad to see some of them here today. So we would do things that would conform to the code, like instead of that big gable in the back, maybe a cross gable, you get the same floor area. Uh, you know, non-conforming, would you put a ranch burger in the middle of all these old gingerbread, uh, you know, uh, Victorian era cottages? I don't think so. Or the, the bottom there, kind of a McMansion type of thing. Um, and then we went around and we looked at cottages. These started as tent platforms, literally. And we rent the tent from the, the uh, corporation office and put it up in the summer. And we looked at architectural details here. Uh, Additions, you know, people always want more space. Do you think the one on the bottom is better, or do you think the one on the top <laughs> is kind of okay? Or windows, uh, pe you know, um, people want picture windows, but on a, you know, a Queen Anne, uh, 1880s era cottage, I don't think so. Or a shingle style building, the one on the left, you know, they would gang building, uh, gang windows together, types of windows, sometimes with. Real patterns. A lot of people don't think of uh, craftsman buildings or arts and crafts buildings. There's a lot of them here in the city as being at all historic. <coughs> but it all goes back to a guy named Gustav Stickley, who in his magazine, uh, he would publish plans for these things. He was not only trying to sell furniture, Stickley furniture, he was trying to sell a lifestyle. And. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what the city is doing now to update our zoning and that does take into account some of what Robert was just speaking to in terms of um, architectural detail. This is an illustration of our zoning map. This actual image is from 2013. Our zoning map hasn't changed too much from then to today with the exception of the rezoning of a few parcels. But by and large, this is our zoning map, which is a standard Euclidean zoning map. It, meaning that it focuses on the separation of uses and it, defi it defines districts and the uses that are, and it prescribes uses for each of the districts. Um, this, our zoning code and zoning math are from 1992. So they are very in need of updating, which the uh, local planning board has been working on for the past several years. And one of the things that we are doing, in addition to doing a, a comprehensive review of the actual text, is that we are looking to develop um, a, a design document, not unlike what Robert was just talking about for Thousand Islands Park, um, that will create design standards for our waterfront. Because everybody knows in Ogdensburg, 
Uh, we are a landlocked city in the, in the sense that we have predefined boundaries and there isn't a lot of room to develop within those boundaries with the exception of our waterfront. As an industrial community, um, the legacy that the industries have left behind are, is vacant land. So this of some of what we have lost, as Robert has so eloquently pointed out, a lot of the architectural history in Augsburg, there are still a lot of remnants of that, that past. So they have looked at what remains and are trying to codify some of those architectural features. And these are just some examples here. Um, and in this slide here that show how windows have been treated and corners have been treated and the materials that have been used. And they're using this as a way to actually codify what and how we would like to see our waterfront developed in the future so that it will be, it will be fitting and it will look like it has been here forever. And once it's built, we won't dislike it immediately. So that's some of what we're working on now. It's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. It's something that the planning board has been doing completely in-house. But it's something that we'll be rolling out uh, this year to the community. So we're pretty excited about that. You know, I gave a program like this in May at the Cornwall Brothers store this summer. And Andrea came. And, um, you know, I started to realize that much has happened since urban renewal. And to the untrained eye, you look around, you don't see it. But urban renewal not only left a legacy of demolished buildings, but contaminated soil, asbestos. A lot of those, uh, the buildings, the remains of those buildings, they're in a landfill that's uh, over by where the old railroad station used to be, up near the Standard Shade Roller Company. And uh, that is not economical, uh, ecological design. Wasting all this stuff, basically. And uh, the, I came to talk with Andrea and this summer in anticipation of this project. And the more we talked, the more impressed I was with what Ogdensburg is doing and what in particular this city is lucky to have somebody of Andrea's stature and dedication, believe me. Believe me. And I think for that reason alone, the future looks a lot brighter than most people might think. Uh, places saved. Um, Lowe's Theater in downtown Syracuse was threatened with demolition. The contracts for demolition had been signed. The crane was waiting out front with its big wrecking ball. And at midnight, the crane was going to erect itself and start to smash this, uh, the last of the big movie houses on Salina Street in Syracuse, smash it to bits here. And 22 minutes before midnight, a group of uh, concerned citizens led by State Senator Tarki Lombardi came together and bought the building and saved it with like minutes, minutes to spare, literally. <laughs> And it is constantly being restored. Uh, it's just a tremendous facility. This is the lobby. You know, part of going to the theater in those days was to see and be seen during intermission. And it's kind of this Hindu Gothic, uh, uh, Chinese, Oriental style <laughs> interior. It's all gold gilded plaster. It's all been restored. Um, after the demolition of Penn Station, developers started to turn their eyes toward this building, Grand Central Station. <laughs> and call for its demolition. And uh, people in New York City, you know, they didn't, when they started tearing down Grand Central, they just couldn't believe it was happening. I think just when they started tearing down Augsburg, they couldn't believe it was happening. And so they put together, uh, they had a preservation ordinance in a, uh, a city preservation department, and they said, no, you can't do it. You can't do it. This went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in the interim, on the, uh, <coughs> On the left is what they wanted to replace it. They had to keep the train, the tracks, and everything underneath. But they proposed this office tower here, and when people said, "No, no, you can't demolish it," well, then they just proposed building it on top. <laughs> this went all the way to the Supreme Court, and in 1978, became an important, important landmark decision uh, in favor of historic preservation. And Jackie uh, uh, Kennedy Onassis joined the fight. Uh, here with Mayor Ed Koch, and kind of, I think, helped change not only public uh, perception, public support, but helped lead this. So, in the, the, uh, it has been since restored. It's, it's the grandest, I think, urban space. This is like the living room of the city, if you will. You know, this is 
where people pass through, where people meet and gather, and so on and so forth. Uh, this was a building that the, all the, the structure that was holding up the roof uh, had caved in. Uh, it was piled with snow. It was ready to collapse. A group of developers got together and um, proposed turning it into uh, the lower floor, uh, kind of some commercial space, which was the owner's idea. It didn't go over too well. It's now a very nice uh, restaurant, though. And then hotel rooms on the upper floor and hotel suites here. Uh, in 1979, I uh, was working with Paul Malo. We went to Sackett's Harbor to look around, and we saw uh, the old administration building. And uh, we went through it. This is 2009. Uh, and so, um, you know, 30, 30 years later, it was still there. 30, 40 years ago, it had holes in the roof like this that you could drive lawn tractors through. Um, and you wouldn't want to walk on the floor over there. You would fall through to the floor below. It had an auditorium on the upper level. It was um, administration buildings for Madison Barracks just below. Uh, wives and wives of brick were deteriorating and falling off because of ice damage. Portico, well, there it is. There it was. And so they wanted to turn it into kind of a boutique hotel some with kind of overnight rooms or short stay, some with longer stay rooms here. So uh, I became involved in the restoration uh, with a team of other people, um, Tom Price, landscape architect mentioned here. So this is some of the stuff that we did on the exterior. I laid out the plan, but I had nothing to do with the fixtures and furnishings on the interior. But here's the portico being restored. The opening. I was getting in my car, it was in November. I got in my car, I turned around, I looked back, and I saw all the lights on. It was dusk. The sun had just set over the lake. And I thought to myself, this is the uh, last time that lights have, you know, this is the first time, rather, lights have been on in this building since the end of World War One. You know, the Army abandoned, basically, Madison Barracks and went to Camp Pinot, which later became Camp Drum, which later became Fort Drum. So that's a whole other story. So, uh, myths and legends. Uh, there was this nice little Sunoco gas station on Route 3, just west of Alaska in New York. And it was, you know, a glorified phone. And I always heard that somebody had demolished it and saved it somewhere. And so I went looking, and I found this guy, David Broma, who indeed he uh, and a friend of his uh, went, and they spent like three months driving up from Syracuse, taking it apart bolt by bolt. Uh, and it's now underneath his deck uh, in Jamesville, New York. And their idea was they were going to collect all these old buildings and uh, and, and build like a, a mall, a strip kind of 50s bill kind of thing. So the other rumor circulating was that um, the Golden Arches, somebody had taken those. So I talked with Dennis Connor. Everybody kept saying, go talk to him. So he's the director of the Onondaga Historical Association. And he said, no, he didn't think so. And he thought the state may have them, but he didn't think so either. So, myth, I guess. You know, uh, who knows where they are? But that was, oh, David was, uh, David was out there taking a photograph of this thing, standing on the curb. And the, the manager came out and said, stop, stop. You can't do this. You can't do this. Don't you know there's a burger war going on? <laughs> Presbyterian Church had a, um, a seminary college in Auburn, and I believe it was the 1920s, they decided to fold their tent and set up shop in New York City. And so they just left this campus with uh, these kind of beautiful granite uh, trimmed with Potsdam sandstone kind of buildings. It, it, uh, just a, a treasure trove of not only architecture, but wait till you see this. Oh, it is one of, I've heard it's the only, and then I've heard it's one of five remaining completely intact Tiffany interiors. So the lamps, the stained glass. And this thing sat there for decades and decades, and people in Auburn kept saying, you know, we've got to do something with this, we've got to do something. And so, in the 80s, this guy stepped forward, and he said, I'm going to buy it. 
and I'm going to turn it into a discotheque. Oh. <laughs> and word on the street was it was really going to be a gentleman's club. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the people said, yes, we've got to do something about this. So they, they formed a nonprofit corporation and have since been restoring the building. Now, uh, historic preservation and the National Trust, if you had a class needed a headlamp or a fender, you wouldn't go and put a Yugo fender on there just because it was cheaper and maybe readily available from somebody's junk or somewhere else. You know, you would uh, restore it to the best you could, and then you might get a little plaque because all these antique automobile and, and, and incidentally uh, boat owners associations have these little plaques. And you, if you go to a car show, you'll see a number of them on the, the fenders here that they belong to this. And that's, a, that's the image of the plaque right there. So if you have a building listed on the National Register, you can get a, a plaque like this. But there are a lot of myths that go with this, and a lot of people really don't know. So the goal is that to help identify historic buildings, to encourage the preservation of historic projects, and to make the owners of historic properties eligible for federal grants and assistance. Okay? What it does not do, and this is where people really get confused, it does not restrict the owner's property rights in any way. Uh, they're still privately held and privately owned. Okay, so it's like it's like putting the badge on your car, on the you know, on the bumper of your car. You, you know, you're doing the same thing, except with a building. And it guarantees, uh, it does not guarantee that grants will be available unless it's a commercial property as defined by the IRS. Building codes. Uh, as architects, we all work with them. And uh, it regulates structures, not uses. Uh, perspective versus performance. It's minimum standards, by the way. Minimum. Is that the right thing? Uh, sometimes I wonder. And there are numerous building codes for different types of construction, different types of occupancy. 2010 is the most recent. There's a new one coming online very shortly. If it hasn't got arrived here already. Uh, this was my right after graduation. This is the, the code. It's about this thick with 55 pages. Uh, the current code is about, each one of them is about this thing. But what's different that we didn't have during urban renewal, we didn't have an existing building code, right? And it's designed to permit, uh, to encourage actually, alternative approaches to achieve compliance with these minimum standards. And uh, if there are alterations complying with the laws when the building was originally built, okay, uh, the building is still considered to be legal, as long as you haven't changed the use or occupancy. Which means, like, say, maybe I change, like, Densmore Chapel up here into uh, a commercial building of some sort. Then, then you do. Yes, you have to comply with current codes here. And uh, the building has been faithfully restored. On the interior, I think there's an interior and exterior shop coming up here. And uh, they were wondering, you know, if do we have to like put in sprinkler systems. Uh, it's, now, it's no longer a consecrated Methodist church. There are already two others on the island anyway, Wellesley Island. Um, but it's, uh, it's still, a, it's like a community center, but the use or occupancy under the code is the same. <coughs> it's, a, it's an assembly building. It's where people kind of gather. Unfortunately, it only has one exit, mm -hmm. which does not meet the code. So uh, we were fortunate. Um, Jefferson County has a building inspector who is very sympathetic to historic buildings. And the regular building inspector came out and he just kind of shook his head. And so he said, I've got to go uh, talk to uh, Mr. Ross. And he came by. And what they were trying to do is restrict the number of people who could use this building and make it uh, current with, the, with, the, with today's codes. But again, the existing building code does say if it was built and this was not designed by you know some inspired amateurs. This was uh, obviously designed by an architect. And um, they use it now for weddings. We were married there seven and a half years ago, and we wanted to know how many people can we invite. You know, we're going to want to fit people into this. And there was a little plaque that said uh, 92 people occupancy. You know, you've probably seen those little plaques in this room. The whole we couldn't find it two years ago, and. Um, but everybody remembered it. So the building inspector said, okay, you know, if, if you turn this into like a, a restaurant or something like that, you couldn't do it. But, so he gave us a certificate for 100 people. <laughs> That's the interior. And now they have, they have concerts there every uh, Sunday night during the summer. Okay. Uh, 
they may put a second means of egress. They may put a ramp on the back, but it's a, it's a it's a nonprofit kind of community center. If they couldn't have these concerts, if they could only have like 35 people there, they would never be able to support that thing financially. It's part of the fundraiser. So it's in the future. They know they want to do it, but at least they can continue to operate. Um, Trudy was going to talk about preservation economics, and she couldn't make it. So any Downton Abbey fans here? Oh, yes. Show my hands here. Sure. Yes, okay. So when Andrew and I and I've talked with Laura, what we've decided to do, there will be an episode two. <laughs> and there will be because we've got so much more stuff to cover here. We're getting toward the end. But uh, we will have another program uh, later this winter or early spring. And probably at a different time so we can get maybe a different crowd of people. Uh, so she was going to talk, she will come and talk about one thing she said. Remember about tourism and when people go to Europe, they go to look at the architecture. They go to look at the architecture, you know, and, and promoting tourism is one of the goals of what the city is trying to do. Um, another, another part of preservation economics is something called LEED. You probably heard of green and sustainable design, and LEED stands for leadership and environmental education and design. And you can have your building certified is a green building by the USGBC, U.S. Green Building Council. It's a third party kind of certifying uh, organization there. And you can be certified for certified up to platinum. And uh, what you do is you have different categories you've got to address and uh, meet. And um, if you do that, that determines if you can be certified and then at what level. And the difference is you're not only comparing the bricks and mortar and labor cost for building something, you're, you're also looking at the, the long time use of the building, the maintenance, the repairs that go into a building for several decades. And that's, you know, for sure you can buy a cheaper window, but w what will it be like in 40 years, you know? Or well, less insulation, but w what will that do for your energy bill and so on? It's not a new idea. Oops. Uh, Native Americans, particularly the Onondagas, uh, have this, uh, this thing that they consider any change they're going to make for seven generations into the future. I think it's Andy's turn. Whoops. Oh, there you go. Oh. It's your turn. It's my turn. Oh, okay. so, <laughs> the city has uh, identified a series of brownfield opportunity areas. Um, you know, when it was a little. The aftermath, as I said, was you know contaminated soil, uh, stuff being thrown into landfills. So uh, you know some of these were old industrial sites or oil tank farms. So there's something called the Marina District, which is on the west uh, shore of the Oswegatchie River. And so Chris and Tom Duffy um, own about 2.2 acres or so in that area with a number of old industrial buildings. So this was a project done a few years, five years ago now to renovate the old Ogdensburg building supply. This is the old Lee Valley tour, uh, tool building. It doesn't look like this, <laughs> if you're familiar with it. But this is a proposal to, uh, this is kind of to turn it into yeah. some apartments. Uh, is Chris here? And he was going to try and make it. Uh, he teaches at Penn State. Tom Duffy was going to be here too, his brother. But he's in Michigan. He's designing and building some curved doors for the Gerald Ford Memorial Library. <laughs> Okay, so I, I wanted to highlight uh, the work of, there's, there's an incredible amount of talent working here in the North Country, and I'd like to highlight, uh, not so much my work, but, uh, you know, community projects that have happened, this is something we did for Sylvan Beach here, uh, bike trails, Main Street, um, revitalization, things that are moving forward with. Uh, this was, this is a building in Adams, and this, uh, this guy living in Sackets Harbor bought the building at a tax sale, wrote a grant for this community group, this Christian youth group, and received funding to restore the building. Then he gave the building to him and generated a huge tax uh, break. So. <laughs> but, you know, there's just all kinds of, uh, just drove by this last night. It's still there looking good. Um, Randy and Beth Crawford are here. Randy, by the way, was a classmate of mine at SU in the late 60s. This is, uh, he's done a lot of work, uh, not only throughout the country, but uh, in uh, this part of New York State. Uh, I've been in 
North Carolina looked at buildings. Oh, that's how I feel. This is before and after. Uh, maybe when we do the replay of this, we, we can have different people talk about it. You got more stuff. I uh, know, you can send me a lot of stuff, and I, I'm grateful for it here. But the before and after here. Yeah, Carthage has got some really tremendous architecture. It's close yeah. to home. Uh, <laughs> Pickens Hall. Which Space floor, floor is being done right now. Space floor is being done Oh, uh, traditional arts of Northern New York. Guess what this building was? The Newberry store. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, this is my favorite. We had a nice breakfast there this morning. We had lunch. Oh, nice. <laughs> it makes me want to go have a cherry coat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, Morristown, as we've got their waterfront. Here with the, with the park, and the docks, and so on. Um, a clubhouse. In Sackett's Harbor, it was built. The hotel that was going to go next to it was never built. He, he found out he didn't own all of the land. <laughs> and then there was an engineer working for I don't know who. He said, who was like in his 90s. He said, oh, I remember when we surveyed that. We never knew where that 10 or 15 feet was. <laughs> anyway, uh, I don't know what's happened with this project. That, that park, it's there. It's there. It's there. Did they build the bridge? Uh, I don't know if there's a bridge. There's a bridge. Small. I don't This was a clubhouse. Uh, the boathouses were built. We started out designing, I didn't put pictures in, but I think six of them, had, they expanded it to 30, which I think made it look like a boathouse motel. But anyway, uh, some of you might remember this building. I won't name names. But I was asked to design an addition, and I was very careful to make it match the scale, the proportions, the form, the massing, the setbacks of other buildings along Main Street. And the owner said, well, it just looks like every other building in Main Street. I said, well, you know, context is important. <laughs> and uh, I did the drawings and was not really involved that much in the construction. They wanted to kind of do it themselves. And a few weeks later, I came up. It looks totally different. I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> um, Jonathan Taylor, who uh, is an architect in Clayton, I mentioned the Guzzle Fire. And uh, the, the handbook doesn't say, you know, pick a style, like pick a, uh, a Queen Anne style or arts and crafts style. Uh, but it talks about new construction being compatible with the form and the massing. And it's called form-based design. And that's at the heart of this handbook that I mentioned uh, a few moments ago. Um, we're going to talk about that in episode two, I guess, more, and how that might work with Robert, you have five minutes. Okay, we're at the end. Just <laughs> about. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lovely. Uh, and this is this is important to show because the Remington has an, a, a relationship yes, with the Boat Museum and the designer <laughs> right here, Miller Diane Grader. And what's important about this too, it's it's not only that, but it's the, the town makes a connection to the river. You know, which I think should be a goal here. Remember those elevations, those views I showed you of the riverside uh, edge of, uh, of the present day wall. Mm -hmm. And you've worked on a, numerous other Main Street projects. And we'll put those in the next yeah. one. Uh, Rick Tag from Bernier Car. There's a lot of stuff that goes on that you don't see. Uh, there was a slide earlier where they were hoisting a bronze uh, yeah. stag on top of the triumphal arch there. But this was stabilizing the building. You know, this is divers going underneath, and uh, he sent this, uh, you know, stuff goes on you don't necessarily see, but this is definitely a Northern New York landmark here. Uh, is Brooks here from, uh, he wasn't sure he could make it, he had some meetings, but he's in Potsdam. Uh, we worked together on some projects in Hamels, and uh, this is a facade program again that we did in Governor Work. This is kind of some before and after shots here. And you can see that it's not all, you know, it doesn't happen all at once. So the buildings flanking this are um, pending. But at least there's kind of a roadmap now. You know, what to do. Oh. Um, 
Okay, this is the, one of my favorite buildings in northern New York. It was on my endangered list it, uh, since this photograph's been taken. Uh, the new roof. And they're restoring the stained glass. It's a, it was a memorial. It's not a church exactly. It was a memorial to Civil War veterans and maybe Spanish American War veterans. I'm not sure. Keep looking at the date. And Samuel uh, Williams was again an Augsburg architect. It's, I think one of the finest examples of shingle style architecture in New York State. And, you know, the, uh, things are changing. Uh, okay, Andrea's got a talk over. So now I'm talking about our waterfront, speaking of change, I'll give you the 60 second site summary of what we're doing um, at the Diamond National Property. Speaking of things unseen, this is uh, about a 17 acre parcel that the city acquired for tax sale foreclosure back in 1992. The site functioned as a paper mill from 1921 until 1987. It was purchased in 87 by a, a recycling company that began doing salvage efforts on the property, specifically the buildings, until um, uh, several drums of unknown material were discovered, at which point they decided that they would walk away from the property and uh, the tax sale foreclosure process began. Earlier in the lecture, um, Robert noted that the that Syracuse has about three and a half year, a three and a half year process. Our process is two years. So um, by the time we foreclose and actually acquire property, it's two years and a lot happens to a building in two years when, when nobody takes over, but two years is even pretty quick. A lot of municipalities have a much longer time. Um, but since acquiring it in 92, we've also acquired the adjacent property in 2007, um, the Shade Roller, the former standard Shade Roller property, and that site is in a current state of remediation. The Diamond National site was remediated and the city received our certificate of completion in April of 2014. So it takes quite a long time um, to get a site from having uh, remnant industrial buildings to today, oops, where it is, that's what it looks like today. Yeah, so. There was one more slide in between there, but that's fine. Um, today the site is, like I said, about 17 acres without the, without the sh um, shade roller property. Together they're about 23 acres. And uniquely this parcel actually also contains underwater lands, which uh, most parcels do not. If you have waterfront property, you know that you don't own the land uh, under the water in front of your property. But in the case of the Diamond National property, we do. Um, so it puts us in a pretty unique position to develop um, piers or, or other water type uses on that property. Um, we are currently working with the Development Authority of the North Country, who is out of Watertown. We are developing an RFP, to, which is a request for proposals, uh, that we'll be putting out in the spring to hopefully solicit developers for this property. And um, we are right now actively completing uh, an analysis of our infrastructure to determine what the city will need to do. All of the infrastructure was removed during remediation, so there's no, while the infrastructure exists on Main Street in terms of water and sewer and, and electric, it doesn't, it has not been brought up to and extended into the site. So the site really can't support development today. We are using grant funds that have been provided through the DEC to do an analysis that will give us the information that we need to be able to put in or, or supply the infrastructure that will be needed to support future development of this site. So it's pretty exciting for the city. All in all, uh, the city had less than $100,000 out of pocket costs for a $3 million cleanup project, so that's pretty substantial. Um, and we're hoping that we'll have um, that type of story on the adjacent shade roller property in the near future. I think it's important to note that a vast majority of parcels along the river were industrial. Mm -hmm. uh, Morissette Park being one of the few exceptions. So I think we're going to have to cut through a few things here, but uh, this was a uh, design charrette. You've heard about the, the uh, river walk in Alexandria Bay. This was proposed back in 1997. Almost 20 years later, it's uh, nearing completion here. So I'm just going to, there's a scuba park there. I'm going to zip through this because I want to talk about buildings that are threatened with loss.
And Andrea, I think, will say a few things here. Yes, so... And we'll end with this. This is the administration building. Probably a lot of you are familiar that this is, this is a historic postcard from the psychiatric center. Um, what you may not know is that our psychiatric center is the only uh, campus, fully developed campus, in New York State that was actually designed by our... It was the only one built to, it, to its fully designed potential and it still exists. However, it doesn't exist like that picture shows it. Um, I'll just kind of skip past this very quickly, stating that um, a year and a half or so ago, the city really rallied against the governor's plan to close the psych center. And since then, the city has, has worked with Senator Richie and Assemblywoman Russell to put legislation in place that will allow us to negotiate the acquisition of what's called Parcel A here, which is about 45 acres of underutilized vacant property. It's not a building per se, but the buildings are a substantial challenge in and of themselves. So the city is currently working to acquire this parcel shown here with direct access off of Route 37 um, that has full, is a fully serviced um, parcel that it would really be primed for industrial or commercial development. And we've even gone as far as talking with future or potential developers with the intent that this parcel could be easily developed and generate income that could be used to address some of the buildings in an effort to potentially save them. Um, but just, these are some of the buildings. These are the buildings, the two black buildings that were shown on parcel A, um, Southwood Manor and Farm Cottage. Farm Cottage has been a both of these buildings have been abandoned by the state. Farm cottage to the point that the state will not let you around it or in it. Uh, and I have lots of lovely pictures of the inside of Southwood Manor, but I didn't feel as though they were quite appropriate <laughs> to share because you may really be quite disgusted with it. Um, but this is what the state has deemed appropriate in terms of how they want to, um, their approach to historic preservation in, here in Ogdensburg. And here is the administration building, a picture of the outside as well as a picture of the interior. There's beautiful, beautiful details in these buildings that right now are being left subject to the elements and, and won't be viable for very much longer. These are a few more of the buildings. The barns are actually the buildings on parcel A that the city will, has taken responsibility for dealing with. We don't really know exactly what we'll have to do. We're, they're undergoing asbestos and lead testing now, which we fully expect that there will be plenty of that. The morgue is the picture on the upper left, and the director's mansion is shown there. Um, so we are trying to work with the state, which is, you know, Office of General Services, <laughs> Office of Mental Health, um, and, and several other acronyms that I won't throw at you, in an effort to take responsibility for this property that has been such an important piece of Ogdensburg's history to try to preserve what we can, but it is really a great undertaking, and it isn't something that will happen overnight. So I think Robert now will probably talk about some other buildings that <laughs> Well, I want to, I want to, and I won't go into all this, but, you know, Sackett's Harbor, uh, Carlton Island, Villa. but I want to, I have a, oh my God. I'll end with this state hospital story. Uh, when we first moved here, as I said, my dad would take us out for drives, you know, to explore the area. We'd go to the Adirondacks, up to Ottawa. And uh, Sunday drives, we used to just go, and the campus at the State Hospital is this beautiful, you know, tree-lined roads kind of arcing and curving around. And the landscaping was inspired, not done by, but inspired by the work of Frederick Law Olmsted, who was participated in the design of uh, Central Park in New York City many other famous parks uh, all throughout the country. So, one day we, were, we drove over to look at like the towns on the Canadian side. And you know there was always this joke about Ogdensburg. You're from Ogdensburg and isn't that where the state hospital is? So you must be a little off, right? <laughs> and so we, we drove along the north shore of the river and crossed uh, the old bridge, which was this rickety old with wooden roadway and so on at the railroad track at Messina. We pulled in the customs. My dad rolled down the window. I'm sitting in the seat right behind him. And the customs officer poked his head in and said, where are you from? And at that instant, a bee flew in over my dad's shoulder, down my shirt, and started stinging me. And I'm going, ah! <laughs> and my dad said, Ogdensburg. Uh. <laughs> 
the custom officer said, Ogdenburg, Andrew, okay. <laughs> so it's taken a long time to develop the city, and uh, it'll take some more time. And we'll talk about that in episode two, which you stay tuned. We don't know when it's going to be. from the waiting list, Marita, you're also in the tea, unless you uh, are full from lunch and then you can give it to the next person. And for everyone else, we're open till five, go into the gallery, see our new Remington art, roam around, enjoy the museum. And ask any questions, make yourselves at home. <laughs>